Hello everyone, how's it going? I want to welcome you all to warm, sunny Florida. <laughs> yeah, right. And this is Access Conference, so make sure you act like you're at a conference as opposed to like a pool party. That's Access okay too. Conference. Luckily no one came in their bathing suits. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, yeah, you guys know what we do. Uh, we do the Rails MV podcast on a weekly basis, amongst other things. And uh, in this talk, we thought we'd go over um, some of the innovations that we see while doing the podcast. We've been doing it for over a year now, and uh, give you a taste of a couple different libraries that we find really useful. So, I give you Jason Cipher, which is a great gift. <laughs> I will turn this conference right around and take you home, whoever did that. Okay, so we're going to take a little trip uh, into the deployment landscape of Rails with my first innovation, and that is going to be uh, Mod Passenger from the Fusion guys. But in order to really take a look at this, we have to go back in time. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Rails deployment landscape has changed considerably since Rails came out. Um, back when Rails 1.0 was around, the preferred way of deploying Rails applications was mostly fast CGI. And this was really, um, by today's standards, not one of the best ways to deploy Rails applications, as has been graciously pointed out by some members of the Ruby community. <laughs> because as we all know, Deploying Rails with a fast CGI process needs restarting about a thousand times every 10 seconds. <laughs> but Zed Shaw, despite his exit from the Ruby community, did give us Mongrel, which changed the Ruby deployment landscape considerably, and a lot of us are still using this today to deploy our Rails applications. And Mongrel works a little bit like this. So you have your web server, and what your web server is going to do, you're going to set up a proxy. The proxy is going to go out to all of your different mongrels that are going to be serving your Rails application. This saved uh, considerable um, memory and gave you a lot of speed boosts when deploying your Rails applications. After mongrel, we got Thin and Ebb and those different servers as well that kind of built on the mongrel way of deploying your Rails applications. But there was some contention in the community because everybody thought deploying Rails applications should be easier. And by everybody, I mean DreamHost. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure everybody remembers this drama. DreamHost kind of put out this blog post that said, hey, we would really like to be able to deploy Rails applications much easier for our customers. And DHH wrote back and said, yes, I agree, do it. <laughs> And then the Fusion guys came out and said, you know what, we're going to do that. You want the job, you got the job. So they came out with Mod Rails, which is Mod Passenger. And uh, that's their website. It's awesome. See, look, you got Rails in a box right there. That's how easy it is. And it's really easy to install and really easy to deploy. All you have to do is um, basically touch a restart.txt file in your temp directory to restart your application. Um, Mod Passenger has gotten a lot of widespread use now. 37 Signals guys are using it. DreamHost is definitely using it. Greg has a couple blogs deployed on Passenger on DreamHost. And the world is good for Rails deployment. Quite innovative. So it changed from that mongrel you saw before with the web server in your proxy to basically just having your web server and defining how many different Rails instances you wanted to have. You did this in your Apache configuration. But what exactly was Mod Passenger without Ruby Enterprise Edition? And what is talking about speed without some benchmarks that I pulled straight from their website? Ruby Enterprise Edition uses a different garbage collector to um, speed up the application, reduce memory, use a uses a different implementation of TC malloc. I don't exactly know what that does, but it's awesome, as you can see from the graphs here. <laughs> Lower is better, yellow is the best, see, right there. And by using Ruby Enterprise Edition and Mod Passenger, you can get significant speed savings and sorry, excuse me, and scalability with your application. That's right. I'm talking about Rails scalability being improved. 
with Mod Passenger, because there are some naysayers out there about rail scalability. <laughs> and Fusion Passenger helped that. <laughs> Those are mine, by the way. <laughs> and I just got my first Google ad payment the other day. How much? $104. <laughs> but that's also from ismerbrails.com as well. So it's kind of skewed since there's three sites and I only put two up here. But thank you everybody for clicking on the ads. If you did, talk to me, I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> All right, so next up, Shuda. I find Shuda to be innovative. It was not the first behavior-driven development testing framework for Rails, um, and I'm doubtful that it will be the last, but Shuda brought some really nice macros to the table to help you test your code much easier. We, everybody's testing, right? Okay, good. I, I have to throw that in there every once in a while or um, people get angry. So here's what Shuda code looks like gives you some very, very readable macros to put in your code. Um, this is a test for a model, which kind of took the application of don't repeat yourself and applied it to testing. Like I said, there were macros before, but should have by the ThoughtBot guys packaged it up and made it very easy to do. Here's what a controller test looks like, and one thing that you get is different contexts um, that you can use in your application, testing as well. One thing that makes testing much easier is Factory Girl. How many of you like fixtures? I didn't see one hand, <laughs> for the record. Not one hand, no applause. That's right, fixtures make your tests really brittle. So what kind of came out of the, hold on, not really brittle, kind of brittle. You have to keep refactoring your um, fixtures and tests as you go along. So the ThoughtBot guys, again, taking the Rails community by storm, came out with Factory Girl. And what Factory Girl let you do was have fixture factories to define your test, like your test data that way. So you can go through and create all sorts of fixtures. Um, well, not fixtures, but you can actually create your data on the fly. It is maybe negligibly slower than fixtures to the point that it really doesn't matter. I've sort of converted all of my applications to using factories instead of fixtures, just because it's that much easier. And you can really keep all of your different logic and date, like test data, in the different contexts. So here's how you would define a factory with Shuda. You can see right here you get some uh, easy ways to get the next thing for an email address. And that's how you would use it in your application. This will create it in the database for you while you're using your tests. So, next up, cash money, I'm on a scaling roll. This is not the cash money that you guys are probably thinking of. 10 years of bling, volume one, I, I would just like to point that out. <laughs> volume one, like there's gonna be 10 years of bling, volume two. Do they have to wait another 10 years? And how much more bling did they accumulate? But I digress. So, what is Cash Money? I took this straight from the Cash Money website. Uh, it's a plugin for Rails that basically gives you transparent, write through, and read through caching in your Rails applications to help you scale. We saw the uh, scaling slides before, right? Can Rails scale? Okay, it can scale. Um, Cash Money is used by Twitter uh, right now. Um, a version of it is used by Twitter. And so, basically, one of the big problems when you have a really large website that you need to have a lot of data replicated across your databases is something called replication lag. So what can happen is, let's say you have three database servers, a master and two slaves. A user goes into, the, uh, goes into their account and updates, say, their login. Now, as soon as they update their login, there's a chance that by the time they actually get back to that page and refresh the action, that the data will not have propagated to the other slave databases. This is where cache money comes in. What you do is, so you have a separate memcache, memcache D, is that, is that it, memcache D or memcache? Okay, so you have a separate memcache D um, cluster 
And what you're going to do, what Cash Money will do, is it will write that data into the cluster, into your memcache D cluster, and into your database at the same time. When you go back through, it reads from the cluster. So that provides um, basically transparent, um, I don't want to say scalability, but transparent write and read through caching. Helps immensely when you're dealing with these larger scale websites. Oh, and it uses all of the active record functionality. That's why it's transparent. All right, next up, WebRat. Uh, how many people have heard of this or used WebRat? Awesome, half the room. So you guys know why it's awesome. It gives you really, really easy integration testing. Um, this is an example from the WebRat documentation about a sign-up process. Instead of actually doing all the, you know, let's say you were going to get the sign-up method in, uh, in an integration test, you don't have to do get sign-up, yada, yada, yada. It provides a really nice DSL for filling in all these things, doing the submits, following redirects. And you can still do all of your asserts or should equals if you're using RSpec or Matchy, something like that. Merb actually use it, use WebRat for its testing. There's, um, it, it, it was compatible out of the box with Merb. And as we all know, Merb is being merged into Rails 3. <laughs> okay. Uh, next up, JRuby. I actually don't have a lot of slides on JRuby, but JRuby was kicking ass this year. Uh, JRuby is just about the fastest widespread um, Ruby implementation out there. 1.9.1 beats it in some benchmarks, but for the most part, JRuby is the fastest Ruby implementation that we have, and they're getting 1.9 compatibility very, very rapidly, if they're not there already. Uh, one other thing JRuby did really innovatively this year is give you the Glassfish gem, which I think is production ready now. Not entirely sure, but the new Glassfish gem provides very, very simple and easy JRuby deployment of your Rails applications. Basically, all you have to do is go into a directory and type Glassfish. Your Rails app is up and running. All right. Another innovation from the Rails community this year is sample applications. Um, I, I'm really not too involved with other web development communities, but I have not really seen anything like this anywhere. Um, a common theme among these sample applications that we have now, uh, including different plugins, RESTful authentication is pretty common, we'll paginate, and you know, Rails already provides a really good base for your application to get you up and running. The sample applications further that along by including all the different plugins, Capistrano recipes, basically even take you to the next step with uh, you know user authentication, login system, things like that, and they're fully tested. One of the reasons I find this so innovative is because new users can see how you're supposed to code a Rails application when they get into it, because um, you know following tutorials doesn't always cut it, so it's really good to see some code in there that's actually used in the wild. Some different sample applications that we have out there, Bort, Blank, and Suspenders. Bort is from Jim Neath, Blank is from, hold on, I got it right here. Oh, I spoiled the whole thing, sorry guys. Um, James Golick does blank, and the ThoughtBot guys do suspenders. Next up, as you guys have probably guessed, is Workling. Last year was the year of the messaging queue with uh, Ruby and Rails. We have so many different solutions for messaging queues. How do you decide what to go in your application? Well, this is where Workling comes in. Just like Active Record kind of abstracts away the database, um, Workling kind of abstracts away your messaging queue. Uh, it works with a bunch of different messaging queues, and what you do is define jobs. Um, this is from their documentation. Let's say, you know, we had a cow that we wanted to moo. We would just define our worker, which inherits from workling base. And then to call it from our controller, we would just have uh, asynchronous moo. And who doesn't want that? You can actually download this sample application from the uh, workling project, there's a link that we'll be providing at the end with links to all of these different projects. 
Worklink supports all these queues, Starling, RabbitMQ, root queue, background job, or BJ, and uh, any queue that follows the yes, I said it. <laughs> you guys. Okay, moving on. Next innovation from the Rails community, open source social networks. I don't know how many of you are freelancers, but there was a time where about every other week someone would call and say, you know, what I need is a social networking website for my startup. It has to combine YouTube, MySpace, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Yahoo. Uh, I need it done in about a month, and I don't really have any money. So if you guys want to work for equity, that would be awesome. Uh, but the Rails community answered this and said, you know what, we can help you out. You don't need to repeat all this code every single time you're doing an open source, social, uh, doing a social networking application. So there are open source ones. First one that came out was Loved by Less. <laughs> Let's give him a hand, Stephen Bristol, stand up. Uh, Stephen wrote uh, Loved by Less. Um, another one we got in Sochi. And TOG. TOG is a little bit different from Love by Less and Sochi in that it just gives you the different parts of the application sort of as plugins that you can integrate into your own application. And, and the world was good. You, you had a really solid base to start with. And finally, the last innovation is not from the Rails community, but the Rails community uses it extensively, it's GitHub. Yes, I know the guys who are Rails users. Um, you guys know the config.gem syntax in Rails 2.2 in your environment.rb? You can use them from GitHub. No longer do you have to wait for you know, all your gems to be updated by authors, just fork the project, develop the gem yourself. GitHub has, like, has contributed a lot to innovation in the Rails community by providing such an easy framework for developers to work with it. And with that, I'm going to turn you over to Greg. Thanks. Did you update the page? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, let me show you guys. Um, we put up a little page on uh, railsenvy.com. Let me uh, open up. Uh, Those are Greg's kids. It's, it's not stock photography. Yeah. FYI. <laughs> okay, that's not going to work. Let me try that. If you go to the following uh, web address, which you'll see in a second. Yeah, I know you can't see nothing. There we go. All right. Sweet. If you go to this web address here, you're going to see a list of links to everything that we talked about. <clears throat> so if you want to follow up, get some more information, yada, yada. So about... Um, how long ago was it? About uh, four or five months ago, Jason and I put out envycast.com, where we tried to do our own you know, selling screencast thing for $9, just like Jeffrey Grossenbach. And uh, the most recent one that we put out was um, Scaling Ruby. Can I get a show of hands? How many people here have downloaded it? Yeah, no, not too many. A couple. OK, cool. Cool, cool. I appreciate it. Um, I pirated it. <laughs> <laughs> See us later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was going to say get out. Um, that's, uh, and you know, putting out these envy casts are good, but yet you know, not everybody accesses them. You know, they've got a good amount of downloads, not making a crap load of money. Um, but you know, I'd like to do our own part to help along the community. But it would be really cool if we could release these for free, like something like that for free. And um, so I was trying to think a few months ago, how do we take that and release something like that for free? And. Uh, you know, we do the podcast, right? And we get sponsors with the podcast. And so I thought, well, what if I go to one of the sponsors, like, say, New Relic, and see if they'd be interested in sponsoring the next screencast, which was going to be Scaling Rails. And they were open to it. And so what came of it was a bunch of screencasts, which we're actually going to announce today and put out the website today, which has I created the 13 little mini screencasts. We're releasing the first five today. And I'm going to show you guys uh, the intro video to these screencasts uh, right about now. You see this on the website. Over the past few years, as Ruby on Rails has grown in popularity, there have been several big success stories. We've seen websites that allow you to do e-commerce, some that allow you to do social networking, others that allow you to get video on demand, and even some that allow you to stay closer to your family. 
But unfortunately, there has been some downcast. No thanks to these guys that, well, Rails can't scale. Thanks to the support of New Relic, over the next few weeks, we're going to be releasing a series of screencasts which will show you exactly how to scale Ruby on Rails. And I think what you'll find is that Ruby on Rails scales pretty much just like any other web framework out there, with the exception that we use Ruby to do it. The Ruby programming language allows us to be more productive as programmers, write code that's more understandable, and thus more maintainable. And in my opinion, it's just more fun. As you can see here, we've got a great number of topics to cover, starting with the basics with page caching and moving all the way to using memcached, and even we're going to get into reverse proxy caching, some advanced stuff. At the very end, we'll be talking to three Ruby on Rails professionals and asking them how they recommend scaling Rails websites, starting out with Taylor Widely, who works for Engineard. After we talk to him, we'll be doing a little discussion on database speed, followed by Jesse Newland, who works for Rails Machine, and a discussion on deployment strategies. And finally, we'll be talking to Jim Gochi, who works for New Relic, and we'll be looking at some of the advanced New Relic RPM features and how they allow you to scale your Rails app. I've got two favors to ask of you before we get going. First of all, please... That's just me, That's just me telling you guys to subscribe to the RSS feed. But basically, here's the website that we came up with. Um, the URL's down there. It's also on that uh, web page that I gave you guys a minute ago. Um, and yeah, so you can go on here, you can subscribe, we've got uh, lots of links here. And you know, I tried to frame it a little bit like Railscast, because everybody's really familiar with Railscast and how that you know, format is set up. You can subscribe to it, you can subscribe to iTunes. Um, and so if I clicked on one of these links, you know, I'd be given code samples straight out of the screencast, so you can have a quick reference. Now the one thing, if you scroll down on this page, the one thing I get kind of, I get kind of annoyed at with Railscast.com, when you go back to those screencasts, the comments, like, it, there's like people troubleshooting in there, and some of them are months, like old, maybe like years old now. And so instead of people submitting comments, I changed this so people can actually just submit links. Okay. So if somebody watches the screencast and says, oh, hey, Lino, I know of this great blog entry that describes how to do this advanced feature that has to do with page caching or performance. I'll submit the link here. Or if you have like an opinion after watching the screencast, you go, oh, he did this thing wrong here. I'm going to write a blog post about it so people know how to do it right. You can then submit the link here. So hopefully what we'll end up with, you know, uh, you know a few weeks from now when we, all the screencasts come out, is a like centralized resource for all the scaling information you could possibly want with Rails. So of course what I hope to do with this website is a, is a couple things. I'm not only educate Rails developers, but I'm hoping to get enough publicity so that it'll make an impact sort of on the perception that Rails maybe can't scale. Because there's still people in the enterprise that ha have that perception that you know maybe it's not the best framework to go to if I need to create a big website. And that's completely not true. And so I'm hoping this will clear up those misconceptions. So, yeah, Jason? Where do you think they got that idea? <laughs> Scale? Yeah. I have no idea. Huh. Um, so, and notice over here on the right hand side, there's a little promote link. Um, if you want to do me a favor, um, click on those links. You're not making me more money by doing it. Um, so, you know, once we, we're releasing, like, we're doing the official announcement next Tuesday, but feel free to publicize it and help us uh, get the word out. I'd appreciate it. Of course, uh, nobody's reviewed this on iTunes yet either. That's another idea right there. Um, but yeah, you can subscribe to it just like any other podcast, which is nice. All right, now back to innovation. Um, the first topic I'm going to talk about is really rat cache. That's where we want to end up, is have a full understanding of rat cache. But we have to have a kind of a base understanding of a couple different things before we get there. So it's going to be sort of a long road. And I, rather than taking the, the perspective that I was going to talk about a couple, like, little things. I, I like to educate. So I want to educate, with you, educate you guys with a couple of topics. Some of this content you'll see again in the, uh, in the screencast, but I kind of refactored it and add some stuff for this presentation. So here we've got a Rails server. And when we talk about caching server side, you know, Rails comes with four different ways to cache right out of the box, right? You've got page caching, action caching, fragment caching, and then sort of like a low level, you know, object caching. But with Rails 2.2, we were given away a couple of different ways to control the cache on the client side, which we didn't have before, right? 
with a power of three different headers. The max age header, e tags, and last modified. Who here feels like they have a solid grasp of what e tags are? Okay, a oh, good couple of people. Um, uh, so I, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but I do wanna review these different tags, these different headers. So here we've got our common controller, right? And to use max age, we basically add expires in 10 minutes. What this is going to do is it's gonna set a header which gets sent back to the server, max age 600, right? So it's saying for the next 10 minutes, this content um, can be locally served, locally cached, okay? Right, content's valid for 600 seconds, unless of course refresh is pushed. It sort of seems to be a default with browsers. If somebody hits refresh, then it's gonna go to the, client, go to the server anyway. Right. But if a server clicks off, I mean, sorry, if a client clicks off of that page and comes back to that page, it's gonna load it out of their local cache for the next 10 minutes. Then you've got e-tags. e-tag is basically a key we can use to see if the page is the same, in a nutshell. And by default, Rails uses e-tags. Whether you know it or not, your application's using it. What it's doing is every time a page is requested, the whole body is being generated. That body is getting turned into a hash using this function here, and then that's what gets sent back to the client as an e-tag. With Rails 2.2, we were given the ability to specify a custom key for that e-tag. Typically, this is where we have uh, models. So we might call the uh, post.cache key method, which I'll explain what that is in just a minute if you're not familiar. So well, let's take a look at a function with e-tags. So we get a user, and now we're gonna call if stale e-tag user. What this one line of code does is two things. The first thing that it does is it calls cache key on the user model when this comes in. It's gonna create a string which looks like this. This is basically the ID of the model and the updated at field of the model. It's gonna take that, work it into a hash, use that as the e-tag which gets sent back to the user. Now, if the client comes back to that page, it's gonna send that e-tag back. It's gonna to check to see if the e-tag that it was given the first time matches the one it just generated the second time it came in. If it matches, it's simply gonna send back head not modified with no body back to the client browser. The client's going to render what it has in its local cache. So we can actually add some functions here in the conditional statement. So if the e-tag doesn't match, if it's stale, we can actually do extra stuff, render out a web page, whatever we need to do. Another way to write this is to use the fresh win command. The benefit of using the e-tag is that we don't have to do any extra rendering, right? By default, Rails out of the box is going to create the e-tag by kind of hashing up the entire body of the page. Whereas here, we're only hashing um, the values that came out of the user model using the cache key method. I hope that makes sense. It's a pretty complex topic, but we need this to get further towards reverse proxy caching, which is where we're headed. So, rat cache, varnish, squid, and Akamai. These are reverse proxy caches, and I don't know about you guys, but when I first saw this, I was like, what the hell is that? Right. How many of you guys like, feel like you know what reverse proxy caching is? Okay, a couple of you guys. Well, I'm gonna try to define it in very simple terms, which is what I, you know, I like doing. Uh, but before we define what reverse proxy caching is, uh, we need to figure out what a proxy cache is. So here we have a big corp. This is a corporation. A lot of people from this corporation like to visit the wallstreetjournal.com. Right, they go out and visit that. Now, they might have a lot of traffic, right? A lot of traffic going in and out. So the boss guy goes to the sysadmin, or the IT person, and says, hey, we need to reduce network traffic. There's all these people visiting all these websites. Let's save some money. What can you do to reduce network traffic? The sysadmin, one solution might be to put a proxy cache in the middle between the server and the users. So now when a user comes out, goes to wallstreetjournal.com, the first time that happens, it's gonna cache the wallstreetjournal.com locally in the proxy cache, send it back. Now the second time somebody goes to that website, 
right? It's going to load it straight out of the proxy. Saving network traffic. So now that we know what that is, what is a reverse proxy cache? So here we've got our typical client, browser, and server configuration, as most Rails apps have, let's see. And then again, boss goes to the sysadmin and says, hey, we need to uh, make our website more responsive, handle more throughput, and uh, save bandwidth maybe, save uh, CPU cycles. So what the sysadmin might do is create a reverse proxy cache on the server side. Okay. So a client comes in, requests a URL, that gets pushed through to the server, back to the reverse proxy, reverse proxy caches that, sends it back to the client. Now, of course, the second time a different user comes to that same URL, it's going to load another reverse proxy rather than going all the way to the server on the server side over here. Okay. So, to review, proxy cache is an extra layer of caching on the client side. Reverse proxy cache, or gateway cache, as it's referred to sometimes, is an extra layer of caching on the server side. And this is where rat cache, varnish, squid, and Akamai come in. These are all reverse proxy caches. Now, <clears throat> with this diagram here, if you went to implement it, there's one thing that I've kind of left out that you need to be able to deal with, right? And that is, how do you deal with expiration? Right? It's something we deal with a lot with when we're dealing with all types of caching. How do you invalidate the cache? How does that happen? And it turns out that you can do expiration by going and using the headers, which I just talked to you about a second ago, using maybe max age. So how would we deal with expiration using max age? Okay. So here's Bob. Bob goes into the reverse proxy, goes to the server. The server maybe has this Rails code, which I showed you a second ago. That gets sent back to the reverse proxy with max age 600. That gets stored to the reverse proxy and back to Bob. Now, if Bob, at any point in time, within 10 minutes, goes back to that same web page, well, it's going to load it out of his local cache, right? However, if Cindy, a different user, requests that same path, it's going to load it directly from the reverse proxy. It's not going to hit our rail server anymore. So for the next 10 minutes, all requests to that URL are going to get served through the reverse proxy. The benefit of this, of course, is we avoid lots of server hits. We can handle more throughput. You know, maybe it's important for your website website to stay up to date, but maybe you know, if it's only up to date every minute or so, that's okay. If you can change it and set max age to you know 60 seconds, you're going to save a lot of bandwidth. Okay, now e tags is another way to deal with this. Bob requests there does a request goes through the server. We set the e-tag, gets sent back to the reverse proxy, stores it along with the e-tag in the reverse proxy, and that gets sent back to Bob. Bob then requests the same page. What's going to happen here? It's actually going to send to the server again. It's going to validate the e-tag, send back head not modified, and send back head not modified to Bob. All right, so we're saving server-side time here because we don't have to render out the entire page and we're saving client-side time because the client isn't having to you know, get all this data from the server back and render the page. They simply render what's in the local cache. Now here's where it gets really, really cool. Different user. Cindy comes into the web page, requests a URL. This is where it's really cool. What the reverse proxy is going to do if it's going to append the e tag to Cindy's request. So it's going to go to the server with the e tag that it has stored. If server returns head not modified, it's going to return what's in the cache from the reverse proxy. That's really cool. So, Max age e tags and last modified. I skipped over last modified because I was trying to keep things short. But my last modified is a lot like e tags. You can watch the screencast to learn more about it. I go into it in more detail. So the benefit of using these is we can decrease server load, um, increase the speed of our website. However, with a lot of these, as you saw with e tags and last modified, we're still going to hit the server on each request. Right? That might not be too good. So what do we do to deal with that? Well. 
we might end up using a combination of both MaxAge E tags or MaxAge and Last Modified. Here's where things get really powerful and you can start serving millions of requests. So what would that look like if we combine the two? Bob comes in again. And now on our server, we're going to use both an E tag and an expires in um, MaxAge header. If I could send back to the reverse proxy, send back to Bob with MaxAge. Now here comes Cindy. Cindy requests the URL, and it's been within that 60 seconds, that minute of time. Well, it's simply going to return the HTML and the E tag back to Cindy. Now, if Cindy comes back and requests that same URL, and it's been after 60 seconds locally, well, no, if, it's been after, if it hasn't been after 60 seconds locally, well, she's going to run out of her local cache. But if it's been after 60 seconds, and it's been after 60 seconds at the reverse proxy level as well, well, it's going to go to check with the E tag. I guess I'm missing the E tag there. Send back head loss modified, and send back head loss modified again. And now, what's in the reverse proxy cache is going to be valid for another 60 seconds. Okay. Now, just to give you another perspective of how scalable this really is, let's take a look at a uh, convoluted benchmark that I, you know, hypothetical, hypothetical benchmark. Let's say we have a million page requests at zero seconds, a million refreshes at 30 seconds, and another million refreshes at a minute. What is this going to look like? So first of all, one million page requests at zero seconds. We've got down at the bottom here how many times a Rails server was hit. First thing that's going to happen here is we're going to hit the Rails server for that first request. All right, so we have one server hit. It's going to store all of these HTML e tag and max age in our proxy cache. It's then going to reserve the remainder of the hits out of a cache. Okay, at 30 seconds, what's going to happen here? Well, it's going to serve them all out of the proxy cache. What's going to happen in a minute? Well, now it needs to revalidate to make sure that data is valid. So it's going to check to see if the e-tag is fresh. So hit our server once. And then it's going to serve the remainder of the request out of the proxy cache. Now, obviously, this, is, you know, this, this example has some flaws in it. but just goes to show you how amazingly scalable something like this is using Rails and a proxy cache. Right. So Akamai. What is Akamai and how does that work? Right. So here's our Rails server. What Akamai does is it puts reverse proxy caches all over the world. Okay. So if we were dealing with 3 million page requests, really, um, that's going to be split up over different proxy caches. So maybe each proxy cache is only handling 600,000 each if they were evenly distributed. You know, and each one of those, when it needs to get the code, when it needs to get the page, well, that's going to hit our Rails server. So in this case, our Rails server is going to get hit maybe 10 times. And not only that, but we're going to get quicker client load because it's the, all of the data is going to be loading from a closer server to our client because things are locational. So now to rat cache. You know took the path. So now, what's rat cache? Rat cache, in my opinion, is reverse proxy training wheels for your Rails app. It runs inside your Rails app, and you can run it as middleware in Rails. And I'll show you guys how to do that in a minute. So here's how we do it. We can install the gem. And in our environment, we do something like this. There might be a simpler way to do this, but this is what I had to do to get it working. And here we're using Rails 2.3 syntax, where we're simply saying, use this middleware. So what does that look like when we run it? Basically what this does is run a reverse proxy inside of our Rails process. So when a request comes in, it's going to hit the reverse proxy, go through that first, then it's going to go to Rails. Now what you might be thinking, what I first thought when I saw this is, wait a second, what if I run multiple Rails processes? Is each one going to have its own reverse proxy with its own reverse proxy store? Well, no, because it's more intelligent than that. You can use a file store, or you can just put memcache in the middle to store it all. Pretty simply. So I went ahead and tried this. Right? I was like, let's get this working with the uh, you know configuration you see here with these different headers. And the first time I tried it with rat cache, it didn't work at all. Totally did not work at all. I was like, what the heck is going on here? Well, it turns out that Rails by default sets this cache control header 
which looks like this. So all, your, all of your requests, all of your um, responses have this cache control header, which looks like this. And this private variable right there is saying to proxy caches, don't cache this. Whatever you do, don't cache this. Right. So not only at the reverse proxy side is it saying, don't cache this, but the real reason we have it there is because we don't want maybe the regular proxy to cache this information either. Well, it's like, that's annoying. Why would we want things to get cached as much as possible, right? And our Rails runs faster. Let's make everything cached. So I was like, why isn't this, why isn't this public? Why don't they create this header as public? Well, it, it turns out, well, when you have this sort of scenario and you've got this proxy cache from this big company, um, if the WallStreetJournal.com was coded in Rails, that's fine. We don't care. Wall Street Journal, it's news. That'd be fine if the default was public. It'll cache everything possible. But what if somebody coded a app bank application in Rails? <laughs> OK? And what if they forgot to set the cache control header? Right? Now it's going to store your bank information in your company's proxy cache. Not good. Right? That's why the cache control here is by default set to private. So how do we deal with this? Well, you gotta add a little bit more code. Looks something like this. So in order to make these work, you have to make sure that the public, uh, that the, the, the header is set to public. And you can do that using these code, this code bits right here. This isn't very pretty. I hope it gets changed. Maybe because Yehuda is sitting here in the audience at well. <laughs> but uh, this is how you do it right now. So I thought I'd put together a little screencast so you can actually see this in action. So check this out. Here's my little you know, basic blogger Rails app. And we're going to use Rack Cache with the new middleware in Rails 2.3. So at the top, now at the bottom here, I'm going to say that I want to use the uh, middleware. That's all there is to it in the environment that config. You can see here I've got the typical post controller just for a blog, nothing out of the ordinary there. I'm going to go ahead and start up my server. Oops. Go to the index action. And as you can see here, up at the top, it's using a rat cache, so it's intercepting every request. And right now it's just a cache miss because I haven't set any of these headers. Now I'm going to add. Um, my expires in uh, piece of code there. So expires in 10 seconds. I have to set this uh, private false public true so it'll set the appropriate header. Save that. Now if I go back to my server here and I do a refresh, now it's going to be using rat cache. And you can see every time I do a refresh down here, you see these numbers? It's saying it's valid for five seconds, three seconds, loading out of the cache, one second, and now I do a refresh. And hey, the cache was stale. It then stored it for another 10 seconds, did the request down here, and it's storing that in my reverse proxy cache. Now let's uh, do some e-tag uh, business. So I'm going to go down to the show method, and I'm going to say if stale um, e-tag. So I'm simply going to use the, put the post model in there. Need to set the appropriate header. Align that. And now if I go to the show page, I can see down here that uh, it rendered the page. Now the second time I do the request, check it out down here. I can see that it sent over 304 not modified. Cool. But that's not the real test. The real test is using another user. Remember Cindy? So I've got another browser up here. I just called up Firefox. So this is a brand new request. Firefox is going to go, and hey, it also did 304 not modified, and it delivered what was in the cache. So it basically appended the e tag to this new request and sent that back to the user, as you would expect. And of course, you can have some fun with Firebug with Firefox. So I can see right now, if I do a refresh on this page, you can see again, this time it sent out uh, 304 not modified, as you would expect, loaded the content out from my local cache. 
So, rat cache is training wheels, meaning, of course, that it's still in beta, right? It's not a full fridge uh, production application. Don't go and throw this on your production app. But it's really good for getting familiar with using these conventions and starting to really take advantage of a reverse proxy. So an interesting configuration might be to use this maybe in development and staging, and then in your production interface, use one of these because each of these is going to behave in the same way. It might have a slightly different configuration, but it's gonna behave the same way and take you can take advantage of e-tags and, and, and uh, you know, uh, max you know, seconds and whatever. So, okay, there's lots of other middleware that you can install with Rails, although I haven't seen too many people blogging about how to do it. I'd like to see more people do that. Um, there's a list of middleware. This URL to get to this page is, of course, on that uh, Rails Envy page that I linked you guys to. And uh, there's a couple other options here for middleware. This isn't just for Rails. This is for any Rack application. One of these in the list is CloudKit. <laughs> CloudKit is awesome. CloudKit makes web services look so easy. I mean, kind of like the first time you looked at Rails and you saw how easy it was to create web apps, I get the same feeling when I look at CloudKit for web services. Basically, you know, CloudKit, all, all you have to do is this, and you've got a JSON web service which properly uses REST, as most of us are already familiar with, so that you can add new notes and add new projects and you know, manipulate them in that. This is all you need to create a web service using CloudKit. I'd like to see somebody use this with Rails. I haven't seen anybody write a tutorial on how to use this. It might be useful if, for instance, you've got some models on the back end that you simply want to expose as a web service, right? So you just plug it in, and all of a sudden you've got a JSON web service that goes straight into your models. You know, no brainer, pretty easy, without having any, you know, if you, why create that, the scaffold for it if you don't need all that scaffold? If all you want is a web service, why not do something like this? Um, next thing I want to talk about with innovation <laughs> is uh, internationalization. There's been a lot of really great work with internationalization over the past few months with Rails 2.2 coming out with, with uh, IE10N. I found this page uh, the other week, which is a wiki listing a bunch of great tutorials and a bunch of great libraries so you can very easily make your web application um, international. Um, it, it's fantastic, the support we have for that now. One of the most recent libraries that I saw that we talked about in the podcast this last week was one called uh, Translate. So with the internationalization in Rails 2.2, what you end up with is a bunch of YAML files, right? You've got you know, your English translations, you've got your Spanish translations, they're each in another YAML file. But when you've got a big website and you have these huge YAML files, they might get a little more difficult to maintain. You might have, want to have you know, outside people, translators come in and give you translations, but you might not want them messing around in your YAML files, right? So what these guys did is created a plugin which gives you a web interface which will manipulate your YAML files for you. So you can give them a, a web address and they can say, okay, I want to translate from English to Spanish, go, and it'll list out everything in forms and they can just type in the translations, update, updates the YAML files for you. Awesome. Um, metric foo is also worth talking about just because it seems to um, bring in all of the great uh, code metric applications. Um, every time a new one and standardized one comes out. Jason and I do a lot of code reviews, right? Companies come to us and they say, uh, you know, can you take a look at our application? Can you help us uh, refactor it? Let us know where we need to improve. What's the first thing that we do? Run metric foo. Right? It'll show us exactly where things need to get refactored, where the tests are lacking, where their code smells, you know. So it's a great way to figure out why you need to improve your code because it runs a, a bunch of different uh, metrics on it. It's also worth mentioning, we, if, uh, Rails innovations, we have to mention MERB, right? With MERB 1.0 coming out um, earlier this year, um, you know, uh, and now mer uh, mer merging with Rails, I mean, it's taking all the innovation which they've put into MERV, all the MERB team, um, and bringing that into Rails. And Rails is going to be better because, you know, because of it. I'm really excited to see um, where Rails 3 goes. Also, um, Ruby on Rails guides. I, I'm really curious here. How many of you guys have read through one of the Rails guides? Right. OK. So most of you guys. That's good. Some of you haven't yet. Um, 
there's some really amazing, useful, amazingly useful information in these guides. Like here's here's the list. It's a lot of stuff in there. Um, some of the really cool stuff, like I read through the uh, Securing Rails Applications Guide earlier. Oh my gosh, so much information about um, security, everything you need to know about that. The kind of information that, you know, you go to like an enterprise corporation, you know, someone's bound to ask, well, what are the security concerns with, with running Rails? And this guide goes through everything you need to know. It's awesome. Um, also something I was really impressed with that came out recently is uh, Noel Rappin came out with railsprescriptions.com, which is like a blog slash a book um, slash a PDF. Um, and on here, he's got this awesome PDF, which shows you how to do test-driven development with Rails. For so long, there was not a good guide for showing people how to do this. And you know, he's got stuff like this, you know, uh, first test first, and he walks people through, okay, we're creating our test for our application, now we're gonna go implement it, and here's how you do it. It's like a 60-page PDF, shows you how to do TDD. It's just uh, awesome for beginners. And if you're not entirely sure how to do TDD. Um, lastly, I thought I'd mention um, HTTP or HTT Party by John Noonmaker. Um, John Noonmaker, if you're not subscribed to his blog, like Rails Tips, please do. Comes out with a ton of great information every week. Um, HTTP party it evolved out of some of uh, John's project. Because what he ended up doing, you see here, he wrote like a Twitter API interface, Last.fm, Magnolia, Delicious, all of these Ruby interfaces, like gems that allow you to interface with these APIs, right? And what he found is every time he implemented one of these APIs, he was like redoing the same code over and over again to kind of take in the XML, you know, translate it, put it into objects, blah, 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 right? So what he did is he kind of took the common patterns and he created HTT party, right? So if you ever need to create a web service interface for Ruby, you know, interfacing with anything, this is your starting point. Look at HTT party and use his gem because it'll make things a lot easier. Um, and uh, you know, that's all I've got. Um, if you guys have any questions, you wanna come back up here, Jason, about any of the things we went over, I'd be happy to take them. Um, and don't forget to check out uh, the screencasts, the free screencasts on scaling rails. Um, I hope you guys find them useful. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Is it too early? To cold? Yeah. So for uh, HP Party, um, if there's already an active resource declaration so that you can resuscitate the Ruby Ruby object pretty automatically, do you is it a bad fit for that? It's more for services that aren't implemented in Ruby have an active resource declaration? That's a good point. Well, active resource, you know, is good if somebody if you know if a web server is really stuck to the web principles, right? To the rest, to the, like the RESTful principles, like you know we all do. But most APIs out there aren't going to stick to the standardized REST principles. So if you really needed, if you wanted to use Active Resource, you could, but you'd end up having to probably hack it up a little bit more. And I think you'd probably be better just going with uh, HTT Party to interface with it. That's the short answer. Any other questions? Yeah. Just to follow up with what you said, active resource is really intended to talk to your own Rails apps mostly. Like for any guy between your own. We had like a long conversation about this. It's oh. really about extending active resource to make it more viable for APIs that are kind of active resource-ish. Yeah. And the conclusion was you should probably use HTTP party. We're not really okay. active resource is more for talking to your own APIs. Can you get any other way? No, I mean, Huda's up here, and he was saying that uh, active resource is more for just talking with your own Rails applications, you know, locally, and uh, you know, if you if you need to interface with other web apps, web app, um, web services, you're probably better off just using HTT Party. Any other questions? No. All right, thanks for your time, guys. We appreciate it.